back to lifestyle management into chapter 13. And this is in part one, and we're going to be looking at health care system in, our can in Canada. Our health care system is based on five principles, and the federal, provincial, and territorial governments have some responsibilities to uphold. Um, it includes the um, funding mechanisms for the health care. Now, we're also going to touch on both the health uh, professionals and also a bit about the you know, about a great importance of how to be knowledgeable as a consumer of healthcare services. So we're going to get started into this part of part one. Now just so you're aware, Canadians have access to more healthcare services and health practitioners today than we've had in past decades. During and since the pandemic, there have been quite a few shifts in health service availability and maintaining sufficient staffing. So therefore, whether there are health services or limited health services, it then is necessitating, necessitating the need for making informed health care choices. Since there are so many and varied services and programs, it requires us to make some more informed health care choices. Understanding what, whatever rights you have as a health care patient in Canada is more important than it has been in the past, perhaps. Now we're going to explore the role of recognizing how to evaluate online health advice, news, and health claims certainly requires critical thinking and a critical eye, if you will. It's really important. You see in your, you know, in our text, and you'll see this here, that we'll be, we'll be visiting this part of becoming a knowledgeable health consumer. With access to the internet and the reams of information on, on any number of topics, health claims are certainly among the tops. So being able to critique and be critically thoughtful about what are the better ones and which ones are just bogus. It's going to be very important going forward. It has a huge impact on the quality of our lives, of course. So we'll also be touching on understanding the difference between federal, provincial, and territorial health care responsibilities. In addition, we will gain an understanding about the differences among various complementary and alternative medicine therapies. Now, complementary and alternative medicines, you're going to hear me talk about them and they're referred in your text. And I'm going to start to refer to them as CAM, C-A-M. That's complementary and alternative medicine. Okay. So, um, we're going to look at some of those terms and how they relate to the general overall healthcare system and the awareness that we need to be aware of. All right, so let's get started into this, uh, this chapter on traditional and complementary healthcare approaches and as it relates to the Canadian healthcare. We'll begin with a little bit of history of our own healthcare system in Canada. Where has our health care come from? Where did it get started? Well, the person credited with the establishment of Canada's health care system was in 1948 by Thomas Douglas. Um, Thomas Douglas was a politician out of, out of the West in Saskatchewan, and he was an NDP premier of Saskatchewan, and he's credited with beginning what we now know as our healthcare system. By 1972, all provinces had joined the plan, creating a nationwide Medicare program for hospitals and physician services. That's an important element because it was back in 1948 that it took until 1972 before all provinces and territories were involved. 
In 1985, the Nationwide Medical Care Act and the Hospital Insurance Diagnostic Service Act, they're involved with the reimbursement to provinces, then these were the two acts back in 1985 that were operating the overall medical health care system. They were replaced by the Canadian Health Act. Now this act is based on the five principles that I referenced in the introduction. Um, the five principles we're going to be reviewing them kind of on a quick, but you'll find them in your textbook and you can check them over, but let's look at them. Okay, the first principle, public administration. So first let's understand the term public. Public doesn't mean everybody out there, the public. It means government. Public is our, we are the government. We are the people who represent, the put the people into government. Therefore, the government is considered the public. In this instance, in how we describe it, it means government. So the public administration means the provincial and, fair, and territorial health care insurance plans. In our case in Ontario, that's OHIP, the Ontario Health Insurance Plan. And they're under the auspices of public administration. Whereas the private services, those are private fee for services because those are businesses. Two, the second principle is comprehensiveness. Now, comprehensiveness. The provincial and territorial health plans must cover all health services provided by hospitals, physicians, or dental work requiring a hospital setting. That's what they mean by comprehensive. They must have a variety and all of the things that are capable and being able to be provided must be available. Three is universality. Here all insured residents are entitled to any insured health services provided in their province or their territory. If you're in the Northwest Territories, for example. So it's not supposed to matter how rich you are or how poor you are. We all have access. All right, the fourth principle, portability. Now this one, here are the services that you have in your home province. My home province is in Ontario. So if you were to move, or if I was to move, say, to BC, my home province would continue to provide the support monetarily and service-wise while I was in BC until BC could pick up the responsibility. Therefore, serious health care, this is very helpful. Portability does not support someone who just wants to doctor shop or service shop. And then the fifth is accessibility. Everyone deserves equal access to all health care services, regardless of where you live or what your income is. This is interpreted to mean where and as available in the province or territory. As you may already be aware, health care costs, wait times, physician and nurse shortages, and some push towards private or public-private health care, these have been called or what we call a two-tier system, where some people get access to higher expectations and others get lower expectations. In April of 2001, the Prime Minister established a commission on the future of healthcare in Canada. Roy J. Romanov, uh, Romano was appointed as the commissioner to review Medicare and it was a dialogue with Canadians and it made recommendations. Now, we won't review all of the um, um, recommendations. However, it did basically say that we're not too bad, but there are certainly improvements that we can be making. And that's not really surprising. So let's now look at what are the federal, provincial, and territorial health care responsibilities. And to begin, not all parts of government 
are equally responsible for health care for Canadians. The federal government is responsible for, first, setting and administering national, federal government national principles or standards for health care system through the Canadian Health Act. Secondly, the guiding principle and direction of health care in Canada is a federal responsibility. By assisting in the financing of provinces' health care services through fiscal um, uh, fiscal transfers. The federal government takes our tax money and divvies it up between the, the provinces. And this is to deliver, deliver services like health care. There's a formula by which to do this so that these transfers are money that the federal government transfers to the provinces to administer not just health care, but post-secondary and welfare and each province decides how they will divvy that up in their province. This is basically the federal responsibility. Next, let's consider the provincial and territorial government responsibilities. Each province and territory is responsible for allocating or managing the delivery and delivering the healthcare services in their province. So the province of Ontario does theirs in Ontario BC does theirs, Alberta does theirs. They're not usually all exactly alike. Secondly, provinces and territories are involved in their own planning, financing, and evaluating of the provisions of hospital care. So if, the, if, if there's a gap in Ontario, it's Ontario's responsibility government-wise, that is, to look at that gap. Provincially, territorially, physicians and allied health care services are, are in Ontario are Ontario's responsibility for their own health care at their own, sorry, physicians and allied health care services. Allied and health care services are like uh, services like chiropractic, massage therapy, these are related services, but they're not necessarily found in hospitals. Okay, and then lastly, the management of some aspects of prescription care and public health. So we're going to look at how health care is delivered in Canada, and we have federal responsibilities and we have provincial and territorial responsibilities. So we are pretty fortunate to have one of the better you know, medical systems in the world. And support for the public health care system is still pretty strong. Some provinces have implemented, implemented sorry, new funding structures to deal with high health care expenditures. We're going to look at some of these. Now, one of them is known as what's called as activity-based funding. If we use Ontario as an example, and the Ontario example of activity-based funding mechanisms is the, is the Ontario healthcare-based allocation model. It's also known as the HBAM for the local health integrated networks. Now, local health integrated networks are also known as LINs. Those of you in nursing may recognize this. The map I have beside me shows the LINs of Ontario. In 2021, the health system planning and funding functions from the local health integrated networks, the LINs, were transferred into Ontario Health. LINs are now operated under a new business name, the Home and Community Care and Support Services. And this is to reflect a focused surface delivery mandate to deliver patient care. This is a form of the Ontario Ministry of Health and Ministry of Long-Term Care. For our purpose, we will keep this to the text content. In British Columbia government, it's distributing its funds to the largest hospitals based on a patient focused service where dedicated funding will be available to hospitals offering the lowest price for surgery. Now that doesn't necessarily happen in all provinces. That's the way British Columbia is handling it. 
Alberta, its health services introduced activity-based funding for its um, new sen seniors care program. We'll be looking at seniors issues um, later. Um, that's becoming a very big activity-based funding uh, area because of the large number of seniors. This funding mechanism is also um, being used in Quebec. It's related to the hip and knee um, replacement program where they get funded according to people coming in and how many people come in and get that service. Ontario, British Columbia, and Quebec are also implementing reforms to reduce the cost of generic drugs. Now, a second form of payment, the bundled payments, it's another funding mechanism that's um, designated to cover the fixed, cover costs for a fixed time period. So bundled payment would mean that you get this amount of money to deliver this service over this period of time. After which, you apply for more bundle payments. This is done on an annual basis. Canada's healthcare providers, according to the Canadian Medical Association, in 2018, there were 84,260 physicians in Canada. This number is an increase from previous years. In 2018, there were 431,769 regulated nurses, 303,146 registered nurses, 5,679 nurses, nurse practitioners, and 1.122 million licensed practical nurses. And on top of that, there were 6,023 registered psychiatric nurses. Now remember, these represent 2018. That's pre-COVID. Those numbers don't hold up after COVID, unfortunately. Now, on the one hand, you might be going, well, that's a pretty big number, but depending on where you live, that might not be as big as you'd like it to be. You might be underserved in some capacity in healthcare. The skills needed by healthcare professionals working in Canada vary from the scope of practice. Now, uh, scope of practice in healthcare providers has been changing. The scope of practice is essentially what your job entails. You try not to step on each other's toes in the healthcare field. It's like a line in the sand. Your scope of practice clearly marks what you can do and what you cannot do. These are the things that are your responsibility. That's your scope of practice. Somebody else's scope of practice would carry on for where you finish and somebody else will pick up from there. It's, an important, it's important with the changing healthcare system then that the source, um, that the scopes of practice, if you will, really need to adapt to these changes in the healthcare service. This sometimes or oft times is a source of a conflict in the healthcare system. Canada has many university and colleges that train physicians to become doctors. You must earn your undergraduate degree, then attend medical school before writing a set of exams in, in the final years of study. The exams are set by the Medical Council of Canada. They're not the only ones to get educated, though, and some of you are nurses, and therefore there's an academic courses and programs for you as well. Now, aside from the general practitioner, or the, what's known as the GP, there are other types of medical professionals, some of which we've probably touched base with in our lives. They include gynecologists, dermatologists, family practitioners, orthopedic doctors, urologists, pediatricians, endocrinologists, oncologists. There are all kinds of services going through, um, that people... Sorry, there are all kinds of services within hospitals and many people go through and get additional training to get these extra specializations for careers in the healthcare field. It also con um, includes those in the allied sector. Now, I just mentioned some of the medical professionals and here are some of the examples of allied healthcare service sector. 
You have uh, examples of dietitians, nutritionalists, medical uh, laboratory technicians, dentists, health information educators, addiction counselors, and pharmacists are all allied healthcare professionals. They aren't necessarily hospital related to the healthcare field. That's what makes them allied. All right. So as mentioned earlier, your medical rights are more important now than they've ever been, in part because of the size and the bulk of what our healthcare system is. Canadians have access to their own medical records and a right to have those records kept private. Privacy has become a very important issue as parents' records are now being computerized and stored in large databases. As you can probably imagine, it's computerized, therefore it's also being able to be hacked. This has become an issue both in the healthcare field and in post-secondary educational places, where people can access records of others they have no business accessing. As, so as a result, we put a high premium on privacy in healthcare. Patients also have the right to receive treatment that is provided with a reasonable degree of care. No willy-nilly approaches to handling health care. We've got to do so with education-based skill sets. This is expected. We don't want practitioners running away or not doing things that they should be doing. We also want credentialed prevention, uh, professionals skilled at their responsibilities to be providers in providing of care. As consumers, we have the basic right to know about any potential dangers, um, receive competent diagnoses, and treatment to retain control and dignity of our interactions with the health care professionals. Canadians have a right to give consent to donate and donate organs while alive or have organs removed in the event of an accident, illness, or injury that leaves them brain dead. There's a system in place to make connections between um, organs that have been donated with people who will require do donor organs. By law, you have a right to give informed consent for hospitalization, surgeries, or other treatments. Informed consent is a right, not a privilege. Informed consent is also required for research studies. If you're going to be involved in any research study, whether it be done at a hospital or in a healthcare you know, providing system, you have a right to be informed about what you're involved in. What are the risks? Are there, you know, what are the expectations and the outcome expectations? Okay, what about becoming a knowledgeable healthcare consumer? Well, first and foremost, we all start with self-care signs. You don't have to be a doctor to know many things about your own body. Your body temperature, your pulse or your heart rate, uh, there are apps for things like that. Uh, respiration rate, your blood pressure. For blood pressure, go to Shoppers Drug Mart where they have public blood pressure machines. You can get your blood pressure reading right there. We can then be aware of how to compare against what our normal readings are. You know, um, you know what a normal range for someone your age would be for heart rate, for example. There are numerous home tests available to help consumers monitor everything from pregnancy to blood pressure levels. So we really can't be ignorant of our own personal domain. So try to do what you can to find what makes you tick. With the internet being an unfettered collection of information, how can I evaluate online health advice? <laughs> Good question. This becomes a very important because so much is available online and so much is just not good information. The internet permits ease of access to cutting edge medical knowledge and bridges the communication gap between high tech medicine. But and however, it also has 
and I'm sure you're aware of this, serious drawbacks. The sale of internet prescriptions has become a controversial issue in Canada and the United States. Um, concerns about public safety, as you can only imagine. Now, I don't know if you're familiar with this yet, but you may. Um, CyberDocs offer virtual house calls with board certified physicians who engage in private chat sessions on minor health illnesses and can prescribe medicine. However, there are no professional standards as of yet for internet doctors. So you must use your critical thinking skills. Healthcare Canada is attempting to play a role in electronic e-health issues. It's been a bit difficult over time. If you follow e-health issues over the last, I don't know, 15 years, it hasn't always worked very smoothly for Canada. But it is an area by which it would make it easier to move anywhere in Canada and have your records be available. When evaluating online sites, be sure you check who's the creator of the site. Does it make sense that this person has this site to manage? Look for possible biases. For example, if you're using a website that is a .com, a D -O, a, you know, dot .com, the .com just means commercial. That means somebody is selling something. It's selling a product, selling ideas, selling information, but they aren't necessarily unbiased or um, legitimate entirely. Dot com just means commercial. Now, that doesn't mean that everything dot com is bad, but it might not necessarily mean good things if you're looking for healthcare information. So check for possible biases. Check for the date the page was last updated. Check for references. If you're getting information on evidence-based material, there should be references. If you cannot find references for claims that are being made on a website, move on. Consider the author. Is the author um, credible? Can you find that author on another internet search to see who they are and what their work has been about to see if they're legitimate? Be a critical thinker. It's your health that's at stake. Now in our textbook, you'll find additional details on this. So please do check it out. How might we evaluate health news then? Although medical breakthroughs and cures do occur, most scientific progress is made one small step at a time. Part of this is because they're going through the scientific method, doing credible empirical research. That doesn't happen in one week. The use of scientific method requires time and it requires many trials to be able to make any sort of claim. So, all kinds of things that occur in healthcare that are progressive, that are credible, takes time. Medical opinions invariably change over time, sometimes going from one extreme to another. When hearing about medical advances through the media, look for answers to follow questions. Who follow questions like who are the scientists involved? Where did the scientists report their findings? Is the information based on personal observations? Does the article report or is it an advertisement including words like amazing, secret, quick? Is there someone trying to sell you something? Does the information defy common sense? Now again, check your text for additional details on this. So for example, any time that you see advertised a pill that says, no exercise, no diet, this is gonna make you slim and trim and have a six pack abs and be able to run a six minute mile. 
question it. There's nothing that we know of, science-based at least, that allows us to do nothing to get healthy. Eat well and exercise. That's it. That's how it works. And that's all we know that works really well. So when we look for things, be careful. Use your critical thinking skills. So how do we evaluate health claims? <laughs> Millions of dollars are spent on medical quackery. That's the word being used in your textbook, and I would certainly support its unproven health products and services. Watch out for marketing techniques such as bait and switch, brand loyalty approaches, or product misrepresentation. There are many doctors, some legitimate, who promote products that are being paid, that they are being paid to promote, but there's no science behind it. In the fitness and health industry, there is a direct emphasis on physical appearance and sales pitches that attempt to make you believe that getting or staying fit is easy. Fitness facilities do hire people with little or no knowledge of medicine or health, so be a conscious consumer. There aren't a lot of easy ways to get healthy. What helps me understand is that I know I can get unhealthy. I can eat bad stuff, stop doing any exercise, but it's not going to have an impact on my body for just a little while. It might be weeks or it could be months. Maybe if you're younger than me, you know, that you might snap back a little more quickly. Um, so anything that's going to get us healthy isn't going to happen in just a week. It might take months. My current plan is to recover from some aches and, and, um, and pains, you know, start re-engaging. I think I started running again in the fall of 2021. The walk-run efforts lengthening over the distance and time every three weeks for several weeks. I had a measured and conscious plan that has me running at now at 65 Ks a week, well, almost 70, but 65 Ks a week today. I have a long history of, well, 50 years of running. So my body's got some preparation for running, might be starting to run. But if you're starting to run for the first time in your life, you take a different approach. You take it more slowly. That's the way health is. All right. So there we go. Part one. I hope this has been helpful and please take a moment and go and look, you know, in your healthcare text and just look at the material and then prepare for part two on the healthcare, looking at complementary and alternative medicine. Remember, that's CAM. All right, everybody. Thank you. And we'll see you in part two. Bye now.